Well, brothers and sisters, it's a wonderful thing for us to be here in Jerusalem, inside the walls of the old city, to consider a number of kings of Judah who were great reformers, but who in the end failed. And there will be lessons for us from these four kings. So in our studies over the course of this next seven days, God willing, we're going to be looking deeply into the lives of these four kings, Asa, Jehoshaphat, uh, Joash and Isaiah. And we're not only going to see great lessons that come from these four kings, but some wonderful prophecies about God's own people, the nation of Israel. And so this first study here today is going to be a background study as to why there was a need for the first reformer in Judah. And we're going to paint the picture of what happened in the ecclesia of God in those times and see why Asa's work was so important. And of course, give him the credit that is due uh, for the things that he did. And this afternoon, God willing, we're going to go out on site and have a look at the place where he had his massive victory by faith because he leaned on Yahweh over Zira the Ethiopian. And of course, there are some wonderful lessons that come uh, from who Zira represents in the scheme of things. And we'll see that that's very, very relevant uh, to our situation today. So, reforming kings. This is the period of history that we're going to be looking at. The, the record there from the division of the kingdom, the accession of Rehoboam after the death of Solomon, and how, of course, Rehoboam in his stupidity uh, brought about the division of the kingdom, and Jeroboam took up control of the ten tribes in the north. And we have a look at Rehoboam. We're going to have a look at Jeroboam very briefly. We're going to have a look at Rehoboam's son Abijah and learn uh, some lessons from his life, and then we'll see the need as to why there had to be a reformer. And Yahweh works in the life of King Asa. By but the way, his name means physician. He was the divinely prescribed physician that was brought uh, in on the scene to correct the problems that had occurred because of the apostasy of uh, Rehoboam. Uh, and before him, of course, his father Solomon, who established the groundwork for the apostasy of Rehoboam uh, and then, of course, the, the continued apostasy of Abijah. So this is the, per the period of history that we're going to be focusing on uh, here this morning. So who is this Rehoboam? We call him, uh, in our King's Notes, the indiscreet. Uh, he didn't have very much foresight or wisdom, as we will see. Now his name means, as you can see there, from the primary root, recap, to broaden, and from the word am, the simple Hebrew word am, a people. And so you see there the Oxford uh, meaning of the name of Rehoboam is who has enlarged a people. And of course that's a misnomer, isn't it? Because he didn't enlarge a people. He brought about the separation of the nation, the division of the nation into two parts. But of course there is a sense in which he was involved in an enlargement, as we're going to see. Because of the apostasy of Jeroboam in the north, Many people left their inheritance in the north, particularly the Levites and the priests, and they made their way to the south. And so there was a great enlargement in the kingdom of Judah. But Rehoboam missed his opportunities to make the most uh, of what was happening. And we're going to see that. He was very unwise. He was the indiscreet. Now, when you look down, we're not going to go through all of these details, uh, you know, one by one. But on that, on that slide, you can see that he was 41 years old when he came to the throne. He was only there for 17 years from BC 930 to 914 and died at the relatively young age of 58. His mother, and this is the interesting part of the story, his mother was Naamah, an Ammonitess. And there are two references, 1 Kings 14.21 and 2 Chronicles 12 verse 13, which spell that out. Her name means pleasantness, but there wasn't too much pleasant about the outcomes of uh, the birth of Rehoboam, as we're going to see. Now, the fact that Rehoboam's mother was an Ammonitess is twice stated in the Scriptures. Right? It's emphasised that she was an Ammonitess. And we know, of course, the embargo that was on Moabites and Ammonites in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3. Because there Yahweh said, A Moabite and an Ammonite shall not come into the congregation of Yahweh uh, ever. And of course we know that some did. Ruth the Moabite as is the classic uh, exception to that rule because of faith. But normally that was the case. You didn't, you, know, you didn't bring Moabites and Ammonites because they showed no kindness to Israel when they came out of Egypt and came to the borders of the land. 
Well, this, this woman, uh, Naamah, was an Ammonites. And of course we know that it was the false wives, the foreign wives of, uh, of Solomon that he shouldn't have married that ultimately turned him and he built altars and temples and places of sacrifice uh, for uh, the false gods of the nations, including Molech, of all things. Uh, and he did that mainly on the Mount of Olives, which became known in due time uh, in the record of Second Chronicles uh, 23. It's called the Mount of Corruption. That was the foundations of the life of Rehoboam, sadly. Okay, so you can imagine what emerged from that. Now he's, of course, of course, contemporary with Jeroboam, the king uh, in the north, the first king of Israel. So this little passage is cited from the king's notes, uh, and it, it endeavours to sum up the characteristics of Rehoboam. We call him Silver Spoon Rehoboam. You know the old uh, English saying, you're brought up with a silver spoon in your mouth, that is, everything's given to you on a platter, you know. You have, never had to do any hard work. You never had to think for yourself, basically. It doesn't produce good results at the end of the day. Children who are brought up with some hardship and with some disciplines are the children who ultimately become wiser uh, as adults. You, you, you treat the kids with a, you know, with a silver spoon in their mouth and give them everything without them having had to do anything, you get an end result like Rehoboam. So we say the epithet, Rehoboam the indiscreet, points to the leading characteristic of the son of Solomon who presided over the division of the kingdom of Israel. He was born one year before Solomon ascended the throne, so he was very young when Solomon became king, and grew up knowing nothing but the prosperity, peace and opulence of his father's reign. We know what the, you know, what the reign of Solomon was like, wasn't it? Just unbelievable wealth and opulence and comforts and so on. That's all he knew. He never knew anything you know, about hardship. never came into his life. So it didn't produce great results at the end. As we say there, this fact undoubtedly contributed to his lack of character development, his indiscretion, and his pronounced lack of sympathy for the common people. And of course, when the common people came and said, look, just ease your father's yoke a little bit and we'll serve you, he went away. He took advice from Solomon's advisers who gave him wise counsel, but he rejected it. He didn't just ignore it. He actually rejected it. And he went to his own compatriots, the young men, and said, what do you think we should do? And they said... Treat them roughly. You know, get, tell them that you're going to really get into them. Well, it was the last thing that he should have been saying, and of course we know the outcome. So we call him relaxed Rehoboam. Relaxed in relation to spiritual things. His apostasy is recorded in 2 Chronicles 12. Now just have a quick look, very briefly, at 2 Chronicles 12 and the first uh, few comments that are made about this man. Verse 1 is probably all we really, well maybe verses 1 and 2, just, just to see the character of the, of the state of God's ecclesia in the times of Rehoboam. 2 Chronicles 12 verse 1 says, And it came to pass, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of Yahweh and all Israel with him. Did you notice that statement? All, right. all Israel with with him. Now that's telling us something. It's telling us, of course, that uh, this, this man um, had all these opportunities given to him. Because what happened was, if you have a, just go back to Second Chronicles 11, verse 13, it says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel, notice the phrase, all Israel. So that connects with the all Israel of verse 1. Because what happened was, because the priests and the Levites had been scattered throughout all the land, and they had 48 cities through the entire land, once Jeroboam introduced his apostasy of the golden calves, they had no job because he made priests of the wide scope. Anybody could become a priest. So the priests and Levites said, well, what are we going to do? So they then went down to Judah. They left their inheritance uh, and went down to Judah. What a wonderful opportunity. It was, because it says there in verse uh, 13 of chapter 11 of Second Chronicles that they resorted to him. And the word resorted means to place anything so as to stay. Rotherham says they took their stand with him. So it wasn't just that they left because of the apostasy. They wanted to take a stand against apostasy. They came down with all the enthusiasm uh, that they couldn't manifest in Israel because of Jeroboam. They wanted to do that in Judah. This was a golden opportunity for Rehoboam, and he missed it. He didn't take this up. He didn't 
use the opportunities that were given to him to use these priests and Levites to educate the people like some subsequent kings did. Asa and particularly Jehoshaphat. Okay? That's what they did. And we're going to see that in our studies. This was missed by Rehoboam. And it says in chapter 12 verse 1 of uh, Second Chronicles, it says, came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself. So, you know, when he became strong, it's time you've got to be careful, you know. The him that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. When he, when he was strong, uh, he actually turned away from the law of Yahweh. So he got away from the scriptures, and when you do that, you're going to get away from God, aren't you? And that's what happened. Look at verse 2 of Second Chronicles 12. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Why? Because they had transgressed against Yahweh. And then it spells out to us what happened. Uh, and, of course, the opportunity had been missed. So that's why you got the use of that phrase, and all Israel. Because now, of course, Judah didn't just consist of Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes that were left with the house of David. It now consisted of all of these people, not just priests and Levites, but all of these people who made a major step in their life. Israelites were given an inheritance in the land. You never forsook it. Take Naboth, you know, the Jezreelite. You don't, you don't forsake the inheritance given to you, particularly in the land. This is Yahweh's land. He gave you a portion of it. But if you are forced by apostasy to make a decision to leave that inheritance and go find somewhere else to live in the south, that is an unbelievably huge decision to make. But they made it. They made it because they weren't, they weren't going to tolerate the apostasy of Jeroboam. So what an opportunity this provided. But it, it was missed. But you see, Rehoboam had a certain smart, you know, street smartness about him. Uh, he might have been brought up with a silver spoon, but there was, there was this subtle wisdom in him in this way when it came to self-preservation. You know, when you're dealing with human nature, the one thing that it's pretty good at is self-preservation. Uh, and he shows that characteristic. So when you come to this record of Second Chronicles 11, verse 23, this is what you read. It says, And he dealt wisely and dispersed of all his children throughout all the countries of Judah and Benjamin, uh, unto every fenced city and he gave them victual in abundance and then it says he desired many wives and when it says he dealt wisely there the Hebrew word bean means to separate mentally or to understand so he had a comprehension of, of the way to manage things he wasn't a complete fool so when it came to preservation of his own interests he was quite shrewd about that dispersed all of his children throughout all the country and of course if you have a family a huge family uh, and they're all together then arguments ensue and so on you know, they say if you put two Jews in a room, you get three different points of view, at least three different points of view. And it's probably true. I mean, I saw this when I was coming into the land. I mean, I, I saw it at, at the taxi stand at Ben Gurion Airport. There's always people. And we sat there for an hour while they were arguing about how to get people from Ben Gurion to Jerusalem. And I would have thought that's quite simple. You get in the car and you drive. But you see, that's, that's what the Jewish character was like, even then. So he said, oh, well, I'm not going to have all this squabbling in my family. I'll put that part of the family out there and another part over here. They're so far apart. And they have no telephones, so they'll get on with life and my family will be relatively peaceful. So he was smart, street smart in, in a sense, wasn't it? That's what this record is telling us. And he desired many wives like Solomon in defiance of Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17 because that was the undoing of Solomon and it was part of the undoing of Rehoboam. So let's just leave Rehoboam for a second. We can see the need for a reformer in Judah there, can't we? Okay. But what, why was this happening? Why were all these people flooding from the north? We'll come to the record of 1 Kings. we we'll go back to the record of Kings. 1 Kings 12. We'll have a look at Jeroboam. Now we can't, of course, uh, do too much on this because you could spend a couple of sessions on Jeroboam. Let's just see if we can get the essence of what happened in this man's life. Now we know he was a man of great abilities. He'd shown that in the time of Solomon. Uh, we know that Ahijah the prophet came along and you know, indicated by giving him ten pieces of, of Ahijah's new garment. This was the division of the kingdom that he was going to get ten tribes to rule. And we also know that the record says that the only two people who knew about that were Ahijah and Jeroboam. But somehow it got out. Now Ahijah wouldn't have gone around telling anybody, would he? No. So who did it? It was Jeroboam. He couldn't hold the secret, you see. 
pride got to him and he and he, he let it out and so Solomon tried to kill him so he fled where to Egypt what did he bring back from Egypt we want to see that brought back certain things from Egypt and that's going to be a huge problem but the real problem was in this man's mind so let's have a look and see what happens here first Kings 12 and verse 25 then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Peniel now, that's interesting. So Shechem. Shechem is always the place in the history of Israel where choices were made. Essential choices that lead to people's destinies. Okay? You can go right back to its first occurrence in Genesis 12 and Abraham makes a critical choice at Shechem. Right down to John chapter 4 where the woman of Samaria all right, makes a critical choice at Shechem. And all through, like Joshua 24, Genesis, um, uh, the record of, of uh, other, other of the patriarchs, Shechem plays a critical role. Okay? It's where you make choices to accept responsibilities before God. He had some choices to make, did this man. Peniel. Now, another significant place, isn't it? Originally named Peniel, because Jacob said, I have seen Ale face to face. But then it's renamed... Peniel, same name, difference in the grammar. Whereas Peniel is in the first person, okay, it's about Jacob and the angel, right? First person singular, I have seen. Peniel is in the third person plural. Peniel is about what's going to happen in the lives of other people, okay? So here is another another man who's got to make some decisions uh, that were made had to be made by Jacob, remember, at Bethel. Okay. Uh, decisions about who he's going to serve. Peniel was the place where Jacob began the process uh, of being made into Israel. Right? So there's a lot of background to that. It's all about casting yourself entirely upon Yahweh in the hour of need. Because when the angel touched his thigh, he could not walk quickly to catch up with his family. He couldn't save himself. Peniel is about depending on God. Okay? That's why these two places are important. Choices, dependence upon God. So this is the issue that confronts Jeroboam. So look at verse 26 of 1 Kings 12. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Notice where this is happening. In his heart. And of course it's here, in the heart. Which, by the way, I think is very capably defined by Brother Carter when he says that the heart is the deeper part of the mind where character is formed. Okay? It's the real us, the real you and me. This is where we make the decisions as to what we're going to do with our lives, what direction we're going to go. It's about choosing your ultimate destiny. Okay? So he says in his heart, you've got a problem here. Let's read on. Uh, he says in verse 27, If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Excuse me? Really? You see, this shows a lack of understanding and a lack of faith. Yahweh had said to him, I mean, the promise made to Jeroboam is, I think, almost the equivalent of the promise that God made to David. All right? When you look at it, it's almost the equivalent of what God said to David. I will establish your kingdom. If you're faithful, I'll do exactly to you what I've done to David. But he doesn't get it. He doesn't see that he has to throw himself upon God in the face of these political, that's what they are, political difficulties. So when you view these things from a human standpoint point, as Jeroboam is doing he starts to wonder how can his kingdom be secured while Jerusalem remained the centre of Israel's worship you know, there's, there's war, there's conflict between Israel in the north and Judah in the south, these two kingdoms but the people are every male is commanded to go to Jerusalem three times in a year and here we are in Jerusalem at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles which finished yesterday Okay? So today's a pretty important day, by the way, the last Holy Convocation, the eighth day. So it's a, it's a very important day in the scheme of things. But that's another subject. So here we are at a time, they're supposed to be here, in this place. 
So that means they're going to, all the males, all of his army, all his soldiers, have got to come down and worship Yahweh in Jerusalem. And so should he. Now that's a problem, isn't it? You think about that. That is a real problem. You have to have utter faith that Yahweh's going to bring you through that. You have no confidence in human ability to overcome that issue. So this is where he's confronted with some choices to make, and he makes the wrong ones, sadly. He says, this is what he says, you know, this, is the, this is the index to his thinking. They shall return unto their Lord. Excuse me? He was there, Adon. All right, God said to him in 1 Kings 11, 35, you are their Lord, okay? I'm making you their Lord. No, he says they'll turn, return to their Lord. Lack of faith, a lack of faith in, in the divine declaration that was made to him. So we see what's happening in the life of Jeroboam. So what does he do? Look at verse 28 of 1 Kings 12. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He took counsel. What? With Yahweh? No. Uh, with his counsellors? No. He took counsel with himself. Right? So in his mind, he's, he's turning over the difficulties, and he makes the decision that it can't work, therefore he's got to take some action to establish his own power. He takes his counsel. You know, sometimes we do the same thing. You know, we, we, we don't go and ask anybody. We don't read the word. We just decide what we're going to do, all right, because of the problems that face us. So there's a lesson to be learned from that. Always take counsel. C- certainly, firstly, from the word of God. But go to those who know the word of God if you've got an issue that needs to be talked about. Go to them. Ask for some wise counsel. Don't rely upon your own resources. You know what the proverb says about that, don't you? You know, don't lean, don't lean on your own understanding. Okay, that's not going to get you anywhere. And here's a classic case of that in the life of Jeroboam. Now it's interesting. He made two calves of gold, just like Aaron did. See, Aaron brought this product out of Egypt, didn't he? And what Aaron did was he says, "Well, uh, uh, Israel, this this is the God that brought you out of Egypt." So he represents Yahweh by a golden calf, breaking the second commandment if not the first. okay. Well, it's been done before. So Jeroboam, who's just come out of Egypt, because the only time he can come out of Egypt is when Solomon's dead, okay? he's just come out of Egypt, he's been down there exposed to all of the difficulties of the life of Egypt. And so he makes these golden cars. But there was a second reason. It wasn't just his in being influenced by Egypt. The second reason was that the ox was the symbol for the tribe of Ephraim. You know how the four four square encampment? You had your principal tribes. And each one of them was represented by a face of the cherubim. And the symbol, the face of the tribe of Ephraim, who was the leading tribe on that side, on the western side of the camp, was the ox. So this this has got nationalism in it. You know, this is about politics. This is about him saying, well, we're the tribe of Ephraim, see? I'm from Ephraim. And he was from Ephraim. He was an Ephrathite. That's his tribe. So he's actually setting up a political structure here, as well as with this religious tinge to it uh, uh, from Egypt. But then he says this. We just read these words. He says to his people, look, this business of going up to Jerusalem three times a year, that's just too hard. I mean, that's, that's an unreasonable demand that God's making here. I think we should moderate this a little bit. I'm going to put a golden calf in Bethel. I'm going to put one up the north in Dan, okay, so you know, wherever you're closest to, you can just wander up there once in a year on my new feast. Instead of having the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day of the 7th month, we'll put it on to the 15th day of the 8th month. All right? So you can sort of do, you can go on holidays until then, and, and this is the time. See, So he's made life a lot easier when it comes to religion, which, of course, people love, don't they? You start bringing in social things, and you start bringing in sort of like, they don't have to bother with doing daily readings, and like... Leave the study classes out. But just as long as you've come to memorial meeting, that'll be fine. All right? You start doing that. The flesh says, oh, terrific, but it doesn't stop doing things, does it? It'll find something else to do. And that's exactly what happens here. Look what happens. Because it says this thing became a sin. And he set these two calves in two special places. Bethel, which means 
the house of God. I mean, all the things that happened here, Jacob named this place, the house of God. And we know from 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, Paul picks this up and he says, this place represents the ecclesia, right, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's picking up the pillar that Jacob propped up that had been his pillow, and he poured oil on it. This was the foundations of the ecclesia of God. Okay? What a place to be put setting up a golden calf. It was about 18 kilometres for Canadians and 11 miles for Americans. Uh, north of Jerusalem in this very very significant and strategically placed location Bethel's significant history of course we all know Genesis 12 verse 8, Genesis 28 verses 11 to 19, spell that out and the other he put in Dan which of course appropriately means judgment and it became later on in Judges chapter 17 and 18 it became the place of Israel's first great apostasy when they, they set up the religion of Micah uh, with his priest, the grandson of Moses, Jonathan, up here uh, in the north of Israel in Dan, which we hope to go to in the course uh, of this, uh, of this uh, time in, in Israel after the Bible school, God willing. This thing became a sin, it says in verse 30. See down there in verse 30? This thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. All right, interesting, isn't it? Rotherham translates it, and the people went before the one as far as Dan. Now that's significant because we're talking about distance here. Dan was 124 kilometres or 75 miles from Shechem, which was at the time, you know, the centre of the government of, of Israel in the north. While Bethel was 32 kilometres or 20 miles uh, to the south. Okay, Jerusalem being another 18 kilometres or 11 miles over better terrain. So if you're going to go from, say, let's say Shechem is your home base, you're going to go from Shechem to Jerusalem, it's not all that far. But if you're going to go from Shechem to Dan, it is a whole lot further, as you can see on the map. All right? A whole lot further. And through some, some of it's flat, but through some pretty difficult terrain. Okay. So, see so what this record is saying? This thing became a sin because they went to the one that was further away. Far more effort to get there. You know, this happens. This happens. When you say to people, look, uh, I don't think we'll have so much intense study of the Word of God. We might just have a social activity, but the social activity is a three-hour drive away. The Bible class is only a half-hour drive away. Guess what the people want to, you know, that really want to have social activities or have a great time will do? They'll drive the three hours through traffic, but they won't drive the half hour to the Bible class. Got it? That's human nature. You let it off the leash and you say, look, let's, this is too hard. This, this stuff about serving God, you know, 100% of the time, that's just too hard. He just wants you to serve him, but, you know, he recognises you can do other things as well. So why don't we just back it off a little bit? And we'll, we'll have this activity over here, but you know, to get there, you've got to spend money and time and effort people will spend the money, the time and the effort, but they won't do the simple thing of going to listen to the word of God that is human nature right? it's happened over and over again in human history so we need to learn that lesson too okay? it is, you know, it's not all that easy is it to go to all the ecclesial meetings and you know, get all the kids in the car and go off and it's hard. we've been through it, we know right? it's not all that easy but, you know, you say to the kids, listen, we're going to go and have a great holiday somewhere. And no problem getting them there. None at all. Okay? That's how we are. Let's turn now to Abijah. We've seen Rehoboam. We've seen the apostasy of Jeroboam. We've seen why it was that many of the Levites and Israelites came down from the north and joined Judah. And they were growing in number. Problem was, they weren't growing spiritually. But along comes this man, Abijah. He's the son of Rehoboam. Uh, actually, that should read, he's called uh, Abijam. Yeah, he's called Abijah in Chronicles and Abijam in Kings. Okay, so his name means, Abijah means Yah is his father, and Abijam means father uh, of the sea, or father is of the sea. But I think Abijah is probably the correct uh, name. Yah is his father, which of course again is a misnomer. Rehoboam was his father, Rehoboam the apostate. 
And he follows after his father. He doesn't do anything to change the quality of spiritual life in Judah. He's not there very long, thankfully, three years. Uh, his mother's name was Maaka. Now, just, just keep this lady in mind, Maaka. She's going to play a very important part in the life of King Asa. We're going to see that in our next study. So, here is his mother, Maaka, who was Rehoboam's favourite wife. Of course, he was contemporary with Cherubim. Now, what happens in the life of this man? Let's go to 1 Kings 15. Let's just see if we can just grab the essence of the, of the character of Abijah. As you can see from the title of this slide, he was blind and hypocritical. And 1 Kings 15 verse 6 is the key to his, to his life. Because it says this. So it's an amazing statement, really, because this chapter, if you begin reading it, it's, it's talking about how he comes to the throne. And he reigns for three years in verse 2. Uh, verse 3, he was not perfect of heart with Yahweh his God, which we'll come to a bit later on. Uh, and then in verse, uh, in, in verse 6, we read this. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Really? What does that mean? It just told us that Abijah is now the king. Rehoboam is dead. He's gone. So why would it tell us that there was war between Jeroboam and Rehoboam all the days of his life? Well, because that's what formed his character. He grew up in the atmosphere of combativeness. Right? Can you imagine what it was like sitting around the table of Rehoboam after the kingdom was divided and he wanted to go and get it back and he formed this army and he went out there and Yahweh says, hey, get out of here, close it down. You're not taking Israel back. I promised it to Jeroboam. Can I? You imagine what it was like? He would have sat there and said, oh, things are wonderful. Around that table, the discussion would be about hatred. Hatred for Jeroboam. Re- no, revenge. That was the atmosphere that his children grew up in. And if around our table we're talking about ecclesial problems and disputes and arguments and difficulties, sometimes, of course, it's unavoidable. But if that is all we talk about, then the kids grow up thinking, life in the truth is about shooting people, isn't it? It's about argument and contest and, and combativeness. Forms character, forms attitudes, and we see it in Abijah. That's why it's in the record. It's telling us. This is what produced this man, his upbringing. We're all produced by upbringing. The outcomes, of course, depend on the choices we make ultimately. But we're all products of our environment, products of our upbringing. And so that's going to be what we have to make decisions about later on in life. Well, he, of course, comes out with all of this stuff about how he and Judah were upholding the law of Yahweh, which simply wasn't true. Verse 7. He was a man of war. It's following on from verse 6. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam, or Abijah, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Notice what it says here. Look at the end of verse 7. Now there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. See? So just like there had been war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, now there's war between Abijah and Jeroboam. So he carries on in the footsteps of of his father. And what he does, he collects his army to recover the ten tribes uh, of Israel back to Judah. He was outnumbered two to one, and of course he makes these statements. So we need to come to the record of Second Chronicles to see his speech. The speech that he makes on Mount Zemaraim. Second Chronicles chapter 13. He says, he stands up, as you'll see there, if you just look back and see in verse 4, Abijah, he's got this army of 400,000, and Israel's got 800,000 men. So he's outnumbered two to one, and he stands up in verse 4 on Mount Zemaraim, which is in Mount Ephraim. So he's up in the territory of Israel, and he said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. And he makes this lengthy speech about how Judah was upholding the things of the truth, which wasn't true. But he does make one correct statement, and that's the one in verse 8. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of Yahweh in the hand of the sons of David. And ye be a great multitude, and there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. He's he's right on that. 
Now, even though Judah was in apostasy and Abijah was blind and hypocritical, guess what happens here? Yahweh saves him from Israel. Right, because there, there, there were some good things in Judah. There wasn't too much good in Israel in the north. So when it came to a choice by God, he preserves Judah from destruction at the hand of Israel. So he intervenes to save this man, even though he's a hypocritical man. So there are some glaring weaknesses in that nation, which he doesn't see. He could have done something about them if he could see them. But like his father... He was blind to, to, to Judah's idolatry, their apathy and their laxity, which he'd carried over from his father's reign, and he'd done nothing to eradicate that. So can you see the need as to why Judah needed its first reformer? Yeah, I think we can see it. And here he is, Asa. Look at his name there, physician. The spiritual physician that God raises up to recover his people Judah from the apostasy that had been begun by Solomon, was carried on by Rehoboam and was uh, blindly carried on by Abijah. Now, he's first mentioned in 1 Kings 15 and verse 8. His last mention, uh, sadly, is in Jeremiah 41 verse 9. It makes reference to the trench that he dug to, to defend himself against Baasha, the king of Israel. Now, we'll come to that story a little later on. That's where the decisions were made in Asa's life, where the wheels fell off for him when Baasha blocked the border and basically attacked uh, Judah. And we'll come to that later on. So he reigned, however, for a long time, 41 years, from BC 911 to 871. Now, here's a significant fact. If you look at the record of 1 Kings 15 verse 10 or 2 Chronicles 15 verse 16, so just come to 2 Chronicles 15 16, it's over the page, chapter 15 of 2 Chronicles, it says in verse 16, and also concerning Maaka, the mother of Asa, the king. Now, she wasn't his mother. Uh, she was his grandmother. Okay? So there's got to be reasons for this. And we'll come to this, to this lady later on and see what she did. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly uh, telling us something. Why should it say his mother? Well, because of the massive influence that this woman had. His mother is obscure. The grandmother is the one who has the massive influence in the nation. And he has to deal with her. Um, and we're going to see that she was queen. She was regarded as queen. And she ruled. She thought she ruled. Okay? He has to displace her. Now, if you know anything about dealing with problems in, within a family, then you'll know that this is not easy. It's not easy. If you're, if this, if this is the ecclesia, if you're in a position where you've got this dominant person in your family that's got great authority in the nation, all right, and is doing things that are inappropriate, and they're your blood, it's very, very difficult to deal with that. We are seeing now in our brotherhood things where people have changed their minds on critical elements of the truth because their children are involved, all right? They're prepared to throw God's principles away because their children have done certain things that they used to teach against. But now they're saying, oh, it's okay. Right. That's the great challenge of the latter days. Asa is Judah's first reformer. You don't care about the fact that this is his grandmother, that she's got this huge reputation. She's corrupt, she's an idolater, and he boots her out. Right? Blood was not thicker than water in this case with Asa. It's a very powerful lesson for today. We're seeing some unbelievable things. If you said to me ten years ago that was going to happen, I would have said, come on, come off the grass. But it's, it's happening, right? Because blood is proving to be thicker than water in far too many cases. All sorts of excuses are made as to why you can change your mind on some critical things. So who is he? Well, there are some significant references in the scripture about this man, King Asa. And one of them is 2 Chronicles 21 verse 12, which you can see on the screen. Now this is in a very important letter. Because this letter is signed, Elijah. All right? No less than Elijah writes these words under the hand of Yahweh. And this is what he wrote when this letter came in 2 Chronicles 21 verse 12 about 
15 years or so after he was removed. And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith Yahweh God of David thy father, Because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah. So this is a writing that came to King Jehoram, who was the son of Jehoshaphat. Okay? So this is, this is Asa's grandson. Right? You have Asher, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram. Okay? So the letter comes to the grandson of Asa. From Elijah. Now Elijah never had any dealings with Judah. Right? He's, he's told by God to write this letter. Okay. So you think about that. Elijah didn't go anywhere near Judah. But the letter is written to the kings of Judah. To, to a king of Judah about these three kings. So it's telling you something about how God felt about Asa and Jehoshaphat. So that's a very significant reference. His contemporary kings were Jeroboam, Nadab, look at the changes going on here in the north, Baasha, Elah, Omri, and Ahab. Alright, so Asa's around for 41 years. In that 41 years, Israel in the north in a state of flux. One dynasty's out, another one comes along, and then they're out, and you've got the, the development of the most powerful dynasty in Israel's history, the Omrid dynasty. And we'll, we'll talk about Omri and Ahab a little later on in our studies and see what happens when Judah and Israel come together by compromise with the house of Ahab. We'll see how important those lessons are a little later on in our studies. So you get a bit of a feel for the quality of this man, Judah's first reformer. Now we spoke about this last evening, this question of being perfect in heart. Look at Second Chronicles 15 and verse 17. It says about Asa, he removes Maaka from being queen because of her idolatry. We'll come to that a little later on. Verse 17 says, But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Notice this, out of Israel. Who was he the king of? Judah. Okay. So you've got, to, you've got to read it carefully. It's telling you that Judah now consists of all the tribes. right? Because all these people would have flowed down from the north. See? So it's a conglomeration of all the tribes. Then it says this, Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Now, sadly, we're going to see, of course, in chapter 16, that he loses his faith. He does not put trust in Yahweh anymore like he did in the overthrow of Zerah the Ethiopian in our, in our second study uh, later on. He doesn't put his faith in Yahweh again. He goes to a foreign king to get help. And when Yahweh intervenes and tries to steer him back to his faith, he rejects that uh, intervention he locks up the prophet in the stocks and so he gets struck in the feet and when in his distress he could go to Yahweh for help he doesn't, he goes to the physicians, that's what his name means All right? he goes to human physicians and so he dies a tragic case, does Asa so it's a sad ending but what does this mean? That his heart was perfect all his days. Well, we saw last night what that means. The word perfect here is shalem, which means to be complete or to be safe. By contrast, Solomon's heart was not perfect, we read, with Yahweh his God, as was the heart of his father David. That's the testimony of 1 Kings 11, verse 4, because Solomon recognised false gods. Okay? So his heart was not safe. Great lesson, this, isn't it? You can go back to Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 13, which make that point. Let me just read that out to you. Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 13 say, There shall not be found among you any anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, to Molech, for example, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, an enchanter, a witch, or a charmer, one with familiar spirits, a necromancer. For all these are abomination uh, to Yahweh. And then it says in verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with Yahweh thy God. There's our word. So what is it? It's about who you serve, what gods you serve. So while Asa failed in faith, he never turned away to false gods. Right. He never went back to worship the gods of the nations, even though he didn't have the trust and the faith in Yahweh that he'd had in former years. So that's why it says he was perfect all his days. 
So in summary, thus it means that though Asa lost his faith and trust in Yahweh at the end of his life, he never turned away to worship or recognise strange gods. Well, that's the end of our first study. And it's an introduction, of course, to what will come. And we're going to have a look uh, a little later on at this man's life. In another two segments, we're going to have a look at his great reformation, the greatest in Judah's history, and then, sadly, the failure at the end of his life. So we'll leave it there for the time being.